The XFX Thick started life sort of like the Cooler Master H500P did on our channel. The point of differentiation will be if XFX improves as significantly as Cooler Master did. When we illustrated the many flaws of the H500P, Cooler Master totally overhauled its approach to cases and released the H500P Mesh and later the H500 Blank with Mesh accompaniment, both cases that we strongly recommended. That's how a company should respond to criticism. Cooler Master silenced us by fixing the problems. XFX still has to show us what its second step will be in response to our scathing review, but in the meantime, we spent a few days testing ways to fix the thick. We've removed the plastic, the backplate, we've added thermal pads, we've repasted it, and more, just like what we did when we prototyped the H500P mesh. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake C360 DDC Hard Tubing Water Cooling Kit. If you're ready to dip your toes into the water and build your first open loop cooling system, the Thermaltake C360 DDC Hard Tubing Kit comes with all of the components you need. The kit includes a 360mm radiator, three 120 ARGB fans, a copper W4 ARGB water block for the CPU, a pump and res DDC combo, and all the fittings needed to build a full CPU open loop. Learn more at the link in the description below. And if you don't remember the Cooler Master H500P saga, it was the same approach we took to this, where first it was a review that was pretty realistic about the many inadequacies of the product. Then we did a mod to it. We removed the panel, the acrylic, put mesh in it. We retested it and we said, this is actually pretty damn good. Uh, everyone should do this, and it'd be awesome if Cooler Master did too. So Cooler Master did, as many of you know, end up making a, a series of follow-ups to the H500P original case that were drastically improved. And the company's done pretty much an about face. Not everything is perfect, obviously, but a lot of the issues that we criticized were resolved, and that's awesome response to criticism. It's, it's about the best way you could do it. So we're waiting to see what XFX does, but in the meantime, it's step two, just like with the H500P, where when we replaced, modded that case with mesh, we are now modding this card, if you can call it that. Uh, mostly it's sort of removing stuff, not really much of a mod. But we've done a few tests here, taking all this plastic off, but leaving the shroud on there. So we left that top bit, that thing you can see right now, with the heat sink under it, and then removed things like this grill, which is attached to a plastic plate that covers part of the lower part of the PCB. We have footage of that in our teardown. And I removed this top piece that uh, isn't much of an obstruction to airflow in theory, but does kind of block some stuff and can be a heat trap. We also did testing with the back plate removed, with, with uh, thermal pads added to the back plate, all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're doing today. The goal is improve this thing without doing any crazy mods. So there's a lot of stuff we could do to, to this to make it really good right away even without going water cooling. For example, we have uh, aftermarket back plates, we have better memory plates, stuff like that, but nothing that fits stock. And so the goal was how much can we do as an illustration of how much could XFX have done if it had approached this more properly and tested things adequately. So uh, starting with a reminder from the review we did, this is where our 40 dBA noise normalized results had the card in the chart. The Thick managed to be the worst performer before the reference 5700 XT and GPU thermals, which is just plainly embarrassing for XFX. The memory temperatures in that chart were also bad, right up there with the MSI Evoke, which had serious thermal pad issues. And so today we're going to revisit that testing with a whole bunch of extra testing. Some quick notes on testing methodology. First of all, this was really painful to do because we did three test passes, which isn't just rerunning the benchmark three times, it's taking it all apart, repasting it, doing it again to make sure that there wasn't a huge variance in the paste applications. We had one outlier we discarded because GPU hotspot temperature can be a little bit difficult to control, and then we ran it again, and uh, average those three results, the plus or minus range was about less than one degree on most of them. So pretty accurate, but a lot of retesting, that took some time. Secondly, we did 40 dBA noise normalized thermals. You do need to control the fan speed for this, otherwise it's all completely invalid, obviously. And the way to control the fan speed for this was we set a custom registry entry, made, a, made our own power play table to fix the fan speed to 1540 RPM because the power, uh, the PWM response to percentages in the software seems to be still broken. And also, uh, a quick note, I saw a comment that said, GN's testing is biased towards noise because 40 dBA testing. First of all, we test with auto also, that's in the review. Uh, secondly, 40 dBA is not silent. 
And most of the cards operate under 40 dBi stock. We have to bring the RPM up, except for this one and reference. And then thirdly, noise and temperature will scale. So if we normalize to 40 and we normalize to 45, the cards that are better at 40, they're still going to be better at 45. So no. But anyway, I wanted to address that. Uh, this testing was mostly done with repasting. So in order to get accuracy, we can't compare it just to how XFX sent it because we're going to uh, torque the screws a little differently than they will. We'll use different paste than they will. So the most comparable results will be versus our repaste, but we do have the original result on there if you want to see what that was. And we used Hydronaut for the GPU. We used Corsair's uh, TM30 for the memory plate testing that we did. And that'll cover the basics. So let's get into the testing. Our first question was how the memory cooling solution could be improved. The number one improvement would be to swap the stainless steel memory plate for a copper or aluminum one and improve contact to the heat pipes. But without a quick and easy way to CNC a new plate, we decided to make some middle step improvements instead. After running three validation passes on the stock configuration with the repaste, we removed all the non-functional plastic pieces on top of the PCB and then removed the back plate. We then tested at a fixed fan RPM of 1540 for 40 dBA normalized results. The change improved memory temperature from 67.1 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient or about 90 degrees as read by the sensor down to 62.2 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient. The maximum supported memory temperature is approximately 105 degrees Celsius, and at the previous result of 90 degrees in an open bench, we would easily be able to get over 100 degrees with a modern case. Case internal ambient temperature on a well-ventilated case can still be as high as 30 to 35 degrees in a 21 degree room, so it's not a far leap to 105 from 90. Removing all the plastic adornments had a massive impact on memory performance to the point where it's sort of embarrassing for XFX. The company went through all this effort to make a large heat sink, named it Thick, and then covered its top bottom exhaust with plastic. Other tests didn't go as well as simply removing the plastic. For the test listed no plastic with plate, we kept the back plate but removed the plastic and found that memory temperature increased by one to two degrees Celsius on average from the test where we removed the plate and the plastic, but it's still an improvement. This is because the back plate acts as a heat trap and disallows free movement of air across the PCB. So although we're still getting an improvement from stock because we removed the plastic, the plate itself is actually an inhibitor to performance without some sort of thermal interface layer. And if we cut to B-roll for a moment, the insane plates test is one where we tried to bridge the gap between the back plate and the PCB, but there's four millimeters of space between the two. So that's kind of difficult to bridge. Fat thermal pads are bad in general, and the fattest ones we have are only two millimeters. So multiple interfaces is even worse than one super fat single interface. And transfer efficiency falls hard, but we still tried. We used a two millimeter thermal grizzly thermal pad for the base, then stuck a one millimeter copper shim on top of that, and then stuck a one millimeter thermal pad on top of the shim. You can't get much less efficient than this for thermal transfer, but it's still going to be better than an air pocket, probably. Using a four millimeter pad would be better, or even better still, bringing the back plate down to only a one to two millimeter distance from the PCB would allow more direct transfer. And there's no reason XFX needs this much of an air gap other than to, to make it look like the card is fatter than it is. But there's no real reason to keep that gap. The components aren't that tall. But back to the chart, we see the insane plates test didn't improve over simply removing the back plate. And this is still on the GDDR6 memory chart. So even keeping the back plate but removing the plastic was uh, better than this, but it did improve versus the stock test. If XFX insisted on keeping all of its McDonald's plastic and also its back plate, they could have still improved thermals by about three degrees Celsius. We saw a drop from 67.1 degrees delta T over ambient to 64.2 from what's probably the lowest efficiency thermal solution after the Nintendo Switch's triple stacked paste. The original memory plate only had contact to two heat pipes on one of the two sides and then the rest of the heat pipes on the other. That was by using a 0.5 millimeter thermal pad between the heat pipes and the steel plate. There was also no TIM contact between the steel plate and the aluminum carriage for the copper cold plate. We next tried adding thermal paste to the memory plate contacting between the stainless steel and the aluminum where no previous contact was made. Still on the memory chart, it shows that adding paste did little to nothing. After multiple runs and averaging, 
We are close to an actually measurable difference, but not close enough to be comfortable calling it meaningful. The difference is under one degree, sadly. Either way, all of these results are better than the stock XFX configuration before we worked on it, which means we're also looking at a mounting pressure issue. We have more information on that toward the end as well. GDDR6 is a flip chip solution, so its die is mounted closer to the PCB than the top of the module, that black module on the top of the PCB. This means a significant amount of heat is focused on the rear side of the PCB, and trapping that heat with a back plate causes issues. The reason we saw improvement from removing the back plate is because the plate acts as a heat trap, capturing air and disallowing free movement of air across the back of the PCB. Even though G6 only consumes a few watts of power each, it's high density and also poorly cooled on the reverse side of the XFX card. EVGA went crazy with thermal pads on some of its recent cards, and one of those ways was to add thermal pads between the memory and the backplate to improve thermals. That said, EVGA also didn't have a 4mm gap to fill, so that's a separate problem entirely. On the GPU thermal chart next, stock repasted performance ended up at about 60.5 degrees delta T over ambient, which was one of the worst performers on our charts while being noise normalized with other coolers. Remember that one, we've repasted the cooler, and two, we're showing delta values. The original results for a reminder was a staggeringly bad 89.6 degrees Celsius as the direct sensor reading, not the delta T over ambient reading. The stock XFX result then comes out to about 67.6 degrees delta T over ambient for junction temperature, indicative of inadequate paste and mounting pressure. Ignoring this result and focusing only on our directly comparable solutions, we see also that removing all of the plastic brought us down to 54.5 degrees over ambient junction temperature, directly comparable to our stock repaste result of 60.5 degrees with a 6 degree temperature reduction. That's a big drop from only removing the plastic. Removing the plastic but keeping the back plate got us to 57.9 degrees over ambient, a reduction of about 2 to 3 degrees from the stock result. Our shim and pad monstrosity worsened the result as it ended up reducing mounting pressure to the GPU from the bulging back plate, despite helping memory thermals marginally. Finally, we'll look at the VRM MOSFET temperature. This is the least important since MOSFETs can run so hot and still be okay, but it's good just to see what's happening on the card geographically, so to speak. The stock solution ran 62 degrees with XFX's paste, or 60.5 with our average reapplications. Removing all the plastic and the backplate brought us from 60.5 degrees LTT over ambient down to 54.8 degrees LTT over ambient, a reduction of about 5 to 6 degrees. Removing the plastic and keeping the plate didn't change much, so the plastic was what caused most of the harm to performance for the MOSFETs. Our plate creation uh, ended up at 58.1 degrees, marginally improved since they're close enough to the MOS mounts that they can pull some of the heat away. Concluding then, pretty simple stuff. First of all, number one issue was mounting pressure, uh, and that comes down to manpower, actually, a lot. So we were speaking with a couple of other manufacturers, not XFX about this, but they're going to have the same problem. Spoke with people back in March, spoke with people a couple days ago when they visited our offices. The biggest problem right now is that manpower in Shenzhen is getting pretty limited these days because people don't really want that job that much anymore. A different topic to discuss entirely, but it is actually getting difficult to recruit factory workers in Shenzhen. If you've been in the factories, you know why. Uh, it's, yeah, it's tough. You're leaning over something for 10 hours a day, and uh, it's not particularly high pay in that position. So factory labor is difficult to find now, which means it's actually starting to affect design. So one of the companies we spoke with was saying that it had reduced the amount of screws in some of its GPU designs because even though the engineers wanted them, the factory pushed back and said, we don't have the manpower to do this many screws, obviously without a massive price increase. So for reference, most of the backplates on video cards are going to be secured by a machine. So there is some automation. You'll typically hit screws like these with a machine, but not everything's automated. And then the screws that directly relate to GPU cooler mounting to the GPU, that's done almost always by hand, and that's because it's so easy to crack the die with a machine. Each one's going to have a little bit of variance in it because the screws aren't made perfectly, neither are the, nor are the springs, and so that's done by a human with a machine screwdriver, but not by full automation. And the reason for pointing all of that out is because uh, mounting pressure does become an issue with cards, especially that have a GP junction temperature exposed because it's so much more sensitive than edge temperature is. So. Uh, Number one issue is mounting pressure on the card. 
Part of that's difficult to resolve because of the manpower limitations. You could fix a lot of this by using all eight of the screw holes that are afforded by Navi. The Navi reference PCBs do have eight uh, screw holes for the GPU cold plate mounting. The company we spoke to recently said they wanted to use them but couldn't because of that manpower limitation. I wanted to point that out first. Secondly, XFX is still to blame for this. Even though manpower is a limitation of design, how you can use screws and where, uh, XFX has significantly hampered the performance with this plastic embellishment with the plate that attaches to this fake grill. And then the, the shroud's actually okay. Shroud and GPU, cooler, do fine. But all that plastic does hurt performance, and so removing that improved thermals a lot. Uh, next one, XFX should make the backplate functional, and it doesn't have to remove it. We saw an improvement by removing the backplate, but it'd be even better if uh, XFX still wants to tick that marketing checkbox, and they probably should, if XFX brought the backplate clearance down closer to the PCB, so it should be about a two millimeter difference instead of four, and then added thermal pads between the components and the PCB backside, especially for the memory, that connect to the backplate. The reason XFX probably has this much space to begin with, one, is to make the card look fatter than it is to fit the name, but more likely, two, is because you want some clearance from the through-hole components that could short to the backplate. But guess what? That's not a problem if you have a thermal pad between the component uh, and the plate. So that would be solved, too. And uh, would also improve the performance for the, the memory. So pads should be on the back of the memory, on the back of the VRM, on the back of the GPU. If they want a backplate, it would be functional that way. The plastic is an issue, and the mounting pressure is an issue. That's probably a QC issue, not just for this one card. It's probably QC in general for XFX uh, at the line. So they do need to probably get some additional oversight on mounting pressure and maybe thermal paste application. So that's done by machine. But anyway, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. A lot of things XFX could fix here, but hopefully this proves that it's possible to have this design and not have it be bad. And XFX, you don't have to throw the whole design away. You can make the improvements we've shown here, starting with backplate and then moving on to less plastic. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly, like by buying our GN GPU Teardown Toolkit, our Mod Mat, or our shirt. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for the behind the scenes videos. I'll see you all next time.